Um, so uh, on my side, we have uh, Ninu, uh, who's a product manager uh, on the Google Beacon platform, and also Annie, who's a uh, product manager on the uh, physical web. So you have um, basically all of the uh, Google Beacon platform represented uh, on this stage. Um, so we can kind of jump through some of the questions. Um, actually, I left my list of internet requests on, uh, on here. So uh, what we do is I'll kick off with uh, two questions, and then uh, afterwards, if uh, anyone in the audience uh, want to ask a question, uh, please feel free to put your hand up, um, and we'll go from there. Sounds That's good. good. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, first question is, um, why is Google creating a Beacon platform? I mean, there are other platforms already. So sure. What do you think? Yeah. So uh, first off, hi guys. My name is uh, is Nirdar Kazani. I'm Ninu. I'm product manager here at Google. Really happy to be here with Dani and with you, Hoy. Um, so kind of like why we designed uh, the Google Beacon platform and Eddystone. So uh, think about it like this. So the Google Beacon platform spends everything that you might want to do uh, with the very high quality, context, precise signal that you might get directly from a beacon. Let's try to like break this down into three main components. The first one is Eddystone. So Eddystone is our open beacon format. Then the second part is the actual scanning libraries that we have, uh, which are platform agnostic. And then the third part is the actual Google Beacon registry itself. So let's talk about Eddystone. So Eddystone is our open frame specification format. So we released this last year in July of 2015. Uh, so it's, it's open, meaning that it's available on GitHub today. You can download it and it actually works on both Android as well as on iOS. Um, it's extensible. So we have three main frame formats today. Uh, so there's Eddystone UID, there's Eddystone URL, which works with the physical web, which is what Ani works on, as well as there's the Eddystone TLM, which is telemetry data. Um, and something that really, I think, that differentiates us from uh, some of the other different uh, beacon formats which might be out there is that with telemetry, we have the ability to work directly with the proximity beacon API, um, where you can actually get health stats and battery stats, uh, et cetera, like directly on your beacon deployments that you might have out there in the, in the world. So the second part is with scanning. So uh, our nearby APIs uh, are actually, it's a platform scanning API that works, again, cross-platform, both on Android as well as on iOS. Uh, and with the nearby, some of the benefits that you get underneath the hood are that you get uh, over-the-air updates that actually help with performance as well as, well as with battery improvements. Um, further, you also can ask for a limited set of permissions, which actually works really well across both platforms. Um, and then also this helps to include things like pending intents as well as background subscriptions that we have. Um, now this basically leads into, with the nearby API, connecting directly through the proximity beacon API and then onwards to our Google Beacon platform, which is like our backend services. Um, and so with that, you can actually add any attachments that you might have from your beacons that you will have registered with Google. And then from there, you can add content that you want to be able to deploy at within your apps. And so this kind of like end-to-end -end story is what we're really looking at forward to. Um, and that's kind of like what we're lo really looking at uh, the developers in the audience to be able to also like work with us afterwards. So if you have any questions about this, we'd love to be able to hear them and see how we can get your apps working better. Cool. Um, another question is, um, there are other geolocation techniques like you know, GPS and <laughs> Wi-Fi. Why should people think about beacons? Yeah, we, we think beacons are valuable for, for two main reasons, uh, separate from other localization technologies. The first is that it works really well, particularly in indoor environments. We spend most of our time indoors, but the existing localization technologies that are out there don't do a great job of being able to figure out exactly where a user is inside. Uh, beacons provide pretty scoped and pretty short range cues as to where a user might be in an indoor environment, so, so it works well there. The second is that beacons work very well for establishing context uh, as to where a user is relative to their location, not necessarily precisely the coordinates that they're at. So for example, beacons do a good job of figuring out whether or not a particular individual is inside of a room or outside of a room, uh, which is valuable context that certain uh, applications can, can take advantage of. So these are two ways that beacons are a little bit different from other localization technologies. Cool. Um, are there any live questions? If not, I will. Um, ask some of the questions that I've actually got from the internet. So you can actually see these uh, on, uh, on my G Plus and Twitter account. Uh, so the first, qu first question is, um, how many of my users will be able to use beacons? You know, what Android, iOS, and Chrome versions do we need uh, for the users to use them? 
Sure. So, uh, so I know that we've been actually supporting uh, Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, so just to give you guys a little bit of context, so beacons actually work on Bluetooth Low Energy, right? So it's, that's, I'm going to refer to that as BLE. So we've actually had support for BLE um, in Android since, uh, uh, let's see, since 4.3, which is Jelly Bean MR2. Um, and so that population, if you look at it from then till now, that's about one point. So we have 1.4 billion Android devices which are there in the public today. Um, and about 73% uh, of all those different devices uh, are actually capable of working directly with BLE. Um, and so from the iOS side, so Android, so let's see, so in iOS, if you have an iPhone 4S or above, and then also an iPad third generation or, 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 or earlier, um, or later, uh, yeah, or later, it can actually work directly with beacons. Cool. And yeah. physical web? Yeah, so specifically for the physical web and Google Chrome supported the physical web. Uh, we're supported on iOS as of Chrome 45, which launched in uh, mid-July. So if you're uh, on the latest version of Chrome on an iPhone, you should be able to use it. On Android, we're, we're coming soon. Uh, but uh, hopefully by the end of the quarter, be able to start using it there. That's a great cross-platform story. It's like launching on iOS first. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a live question. Uh, what about desktop? What about desktop? Specifically for the physical web? Yeah. Uh, we're very focused on the mobile use case in particular. You know, we think that's where beacons make a lot of sense uh, as users sort of interact with the physical world and can discover URLs in various locations. So we're prioritizing mobile for now. Um, in the future, it might make sense for, for us to evolve into desktop, but it's currently not in our plans. All right. Another um, question from the internet is: um, This particular developer is considering using uh, beacons for positioning. So just kind of deploy a whole bunch of beacons and then do very precise positioning within the room. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Uh, so as I mentioned when describing sort of where beacons are particularly valuable, one one of the points I was talking about was how it provides very good context as to where a user might be. And this is sort of the the use case that we like to encourage with a beacon deployment. Because of the way that uh, you can track where a user is from a beacon uh, using RSSI values that are very variable in different indoor locations based on the material of the environment, based on how many individuals are inside the room, we don't think beacons are a very great technology for figuring out precisely the coordinates of a user in, in a location, but where it is useful is figuring out whether or not a user is within a certain region. So we tend to encourage context-based applications rather than localization-based applications. Some of the other things I think that we can also do is using like the Places API, which is there, so that allows you to have uh, a level of context of like what is the lat, what is the long, and then also are you indoors or are you in a particular region, so that helps to also provide a little bit better precision. Cool. Um, another question that we get is, um, because we do have multiple, multiple frame types within Eddystone, mm -hmm. um, what's the best practice in terms of combining those different types? Sure, so, um, so I'll take that one. So with, uh, we currently have three different frame formats, right? So there's UID, URL, and TLM. So uh, with, with TLM specifically, with telemetry, this kind of gives us a little bit more of that differentiator. And so we actually recommend and we actually encourage you to be able to have an Eddystone UID as well as TLM frame and then being able to actually transmit those together uh, in parallel. Um, for something else also like with telemetry, uh, the benefit is if you if you are in let's say a, a, a very local kind of like region one that may be a little bit more remote you might want to actually uh, broadcast your TLM packet a little bit more frequently as well so it's able to be picked up easier. We we call the process of concurrent broadcasting sort of interleaving and mm -hmm. one of the nice things is if configured properly interleaving actually does not hurt the performance of a beacon deployment it's very minimal in terms of its power consumption right. so it's it's a great way of sort of uh, broadcasting all the different frame types that a deployer might want to without sacrificing performance. Live question. Um, so uh, yesterday, seeing what you saw the Project Tango demo, which was really amazing, I'm kind of wondering, like, should we pair that with Beacon somehow to kind of help, you know, maybe help people who um, have vision impairments but be able to navigate the room and be able to, you know, figure out where people live where they live? Sure. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, let me just repeat that question. So, um, you know, yesterday we saw the demo from Project Tango. Um, you know, how we could, uh, you know, what, what are the different ways that we can combine that uh, with Beacon to, you know, enable uh, people that might have visual impairment uh, in this case to, you know, help them navigate around? You want to jump in? 
I was going to let you talk about sure. Wayfinder. No yeah. problem. Yeah. Uh, so let me talk about Wayfinder for like a minute. Um, so Wayfinder is an open standard that uh, Google.org, which is like our philanthropic arm at Google, they actually gave them uh, $1 million. So this happened in December. And so the concept is in London, if you're going through the, the tube, if you're going between, let's say, the Piccadilly line to, let's say, somewhere else, for, for people like us who have the ability to be able to see, it's really, really easy, right? It's much easier for, than for someone who's visually impaired. Um, but what we're, what we're actually looking at uh, and actually doing is seeing how can you get from point A to point B if you're visually impaired? And can, you, can beacons actually help guide that experience and make that possible, right? So will it actually say, okay, go down this particular uh, tunnel, take a right, go up the stairs, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that those are the kind of things that we're actually looking into and seeing how we can actually help accessibility-based features and try to move those forward as well in the stack. Um, I think it's a really interesting idea with Project Tango, and uh, it's not something that we've actually looked at today, but it, it gives us some, some ideas on where we actually could move forward. So thank you for that recommendation. We were also chatting with folks at, at the Beacon office hours earlier today about other potential sort of Tango Beacon integrations, and someone brought up the really interesting idea of using Tango mapped spatial location to sort of cue what ideal deployments could look like in a room. For example, if you were able to map a room with Tango, could you then use that information to figure out where you could optimally place beacons to cover the entire environment, uh, sort of what sort of signal strength that you need to put those beacons at in order to blanket the room. So there's other sort of applications with, with Tango too that we haven't looked into yet, but certainly the, I think the door is open. I think we have a question. So the question there is, uh, does the uh, proximity beacon API or nearby work with other types of beacons that are not Eddystone? Yeah, so we're actually focused right now on, on Eddystone primarily because that is like what we're doubling down our efforts on. So I think a lot of our, our time and effort is going to be focused on Eddystone in the, in the next upcoming months and, and year. And we think that by keeping it open and kind of like that, that concept on GitHub where anyone can actually commit to it and we can make the platform better, that's kind of like our vision for how we're going to be able to scale our efforts moving forward. Yeah, and just uh, add to that, I think with the Proximity Beacon API, you can uh, register other beacon types. Um, but as we kind of said earlier, you know, with Eddystone, you get the telemetry frame and mm -hmm. you get the uh, URL frame. So we're, you know, hoping that developers will um, kind of look at that and say, wow, you know, that all that extra functionality is really useful to me. And as a result, they would choose Eddystone, um, e maybe even on its own uh, merit um, on, on that front. So, yeah. The only other thing I would add is that um, for a given beacon deployment, Eddystone isn't mutually exclusive with a different type of sort of beacon format. So developers can, on the same beacon, deploy multiple different types of formats. Yeah, so the um, sort of context there was um, for existing kind of like deployed beacon already, you know, can they utilize some of the cloud service? So uh, the answer is yes, uh, you can uh, register um, those beacons uh, with, the, uh, with the Proximity Beacon API. Um, if not, I'll go down the list. So um, there is uh, also another question about, um, because we have got 18 partners already, mm -hmm. uh, all producing well, m many producing multiple uh, models of beacon. Um, is there an easy way to kind of look at the specs and um, what differences would would that, would that be from choosing kind of one manufacturer over another another one? Yeah, I think uh, so. So the concept is this, right? So because Eddystone is so open, we we have 18 partners today. So if you go to g.co/beacons, you can actually take a look at all the different partners which are there, um, and I think. The, the benefit and kind of like the reason why we even have this pl this open platform is so we have multiple different OEMs that can actually work with uh, work with us as Google, um, and then each and every single different partner has their own strengths, right? And so they have different services that you all can choose from, um, and that's kind of like the benefits of the of actually using Eddystone in general. Um, we are working very strongly with all the different OEMs to make provisioning easier, as well as registration directly through our proximity beacon API, and then also um, directly with our with our backend, um, with our services. So the Google Beacon platform is very much so focused on on seeing how we can get 
um, a lot easier like for developers to start using it from the ground up. And so we'll look for that in the next upcoming uh, quarters. Yeah. And, and it's important to note that when we say partners, um, we don't necessarily mean that these are uh, the vendors who we encourage uh, developers to use. These are just ones that have met the proper sort of Edistone certification process that are faithfully reproducing the spec that we have on GitHub. Uh, beyond that, you know, as Nino mentioned, they all have different different points uh, of uh, differentiation, and it's up to the individual developer to decide which one they'd like to use. And just to kind of add to that answer, the um, another thing is the, the, the strength of um, you know those eighteen partners and the, the ecosystem that we have is um, depending on your use case, you can you might want to choose different types of beacon. So you know if you have a mains power, you know readily available within the room that you want to deploy. You might just want to plug a beacon into that uh, into that socket, and as a result, you don't need to worry about you know replacing or or the battery power at all. Uh, or alternatively, if you're thinking about really possible use case and 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 you want the smallest possible beacon, we also have you know some partners that produce kind of coin size um, beacons as well. So you know you can choose kind of whatever uh, that suits your your particular use case. Um, anything? Nope. Cool. Um, so going down, so for the physical web, what would the uh, experience be like? I guess it's for the people that um, was not in um, Scott's kind of um, presentation. And I've got a slide that might help any. Sure. You can run through that. So some of you folks who are in the room for Scott Jensen's presentation might have already seen this. But this is just sort of an overview of what the physical web experience looks like today on, uh, on iOS and Android. So on iOS, uh, for anyone who has an iPhone, you know, feel free to start playing with this now. Uh, but the main sort of surface for interaction for the physical web is through the Today View, which is a, a concept that iOS introduced, I believe, a couple releases ago. Uh, that's effectively Apple's uh, interpretation of widgets. And so Chrome has a Today View widget that users can add. Uh, and whenever you're around a beacon, uh, you can opt into the physical web contextually. Uh, and then in the future, whenever you're around beacons that are broadcasting uh, URLs, you'll be able to see those lists of URLs when you go to this dedicated Today View. Uh, on Android, the story is a little bit different uh, because we can uh, have a little bit more flexibility in the way that we do notification management. Uh, and so the main sort of mode of interaction on Android is a low priority notification, which is a notification that's delivered to the user's device without uh, buzzing or vibrating the phone. So uh, it still appears sort of in the standard notification tray. Uh, when the user swipes down, they'll be able to see uh, the low priority notification on the bottom, but without, uh, without it interrupting the user's workflow. So this is our way of allowing users to always go to a persistent UI surface that uh, has physical web URLs uh, available there if, if they're around a beacon without interrupting their workflow. Um, so whenever you're around a beacon, uh, you'd be able to swipe down, see this notification, tap on it, and see the list of, uh, of nearby websites. And when you're not around a beacon, the notification just clears itself away. I think like the awesome part about this is you don't even have to have an app install. Right. Like it's directly there with the experience. And with, you can deploy Chrome, content. Right. Yeah. Right. You just need Chrome as a user. Cool. Um, next, can you talk a little bit about the um, telemetry frame and you know how that helps the developers on maintenance? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I had actually mentioned this a little bit earlier, um, but with telemetry, uh, what we actually do, as, as Ani had also pointed out, about interleaving, we actually say that you should uh, have an Eddystone UID as well as TLM frame together. And so interleaving those two is kind of like the, the recommendation that we have. Um, Further, some of the things that we can do today within the platform in terms of surfacing through the Proximity Beacon API um, is if, you're, if you have a set of beacons and then you want uh, the, to know like, what the actual health is of that beacon, is it about to die or whatnot, we can actually provide an alert for that and, and actually tell you, yes, your beacon is about to die. You may want to go out and actually change the battery. Um, and then uh, in general, it's kind of like, we're really focused on in making sure that those beacons which are positioned and when you have actually deployed them are exactly where you kept them. So let's say that uh, you have deployed a set of beacons and that uh, someone came and then just ripped it off or something happened where it's actually moved. We can actually provide an alert also saying that a beacon is moved as well. So those are some of the things that we can do with telemetry today. Yeah, so, so think about it like this, right? So if you have an app, and so in your app, if you have the nearby API, then the nearby API would then be able to take uh, TLM-based packets and then send that directly to the Google Beacon platform. 
Um, and so through there, we can basically be able to determine and then provide those alerts accordingly to your apps. Question. So the question there is, what are the conditions um, and are there any charges using the Google Beacon platform? So, uh, so the Google Beacon platform today is, is there. So we have our developer terms of service. So when you actually sign up for a Google Developer Console account, you have to basically go accordingly to our TOS from there. Um, and then it's, uh, it's everything is free for the public to be able to go out and use as long as uh, you've accepted the agreement and then you move forward from there with your actual deployments and attachment data. And the same is true for the physical web as well. Um, there's no cost. All you have to do is point the beacon to a URL. Cool. Um, are there areas of developer experience that you guys want to improve? Yeah, I would say like the first thing is uh, is provisioning an app, um, and then being sorry, excuse me, provisioning a beacon directly so that it works uniformly and seamlessly within your app. Um, we're working really strongly with all the different OEMs uh, on that, and registration is also something that we're looking at trying to improve also to make that a much more seamless behind the scenes. Uh, for larger developers who might be deploying a lot of beacons, we want to do a better job of helping them uh, be able to do fleet management, so remotely. Uh, update those beacons, uh, manage the beacons sort of status and health. Nuno mentioned the telemetry frame. We ran a lot of experiments last year with uh, larger deployments that leveraged the telemetry frame. Um, so we hope to, to use some of those learnings this year in, in helping some of our larger deployments out. Uh, and finally, I'd say we want to improve the scanning experience on the nearby uh, APIs. That's something that we always think we can do a better job of, both from a performance standpoint, uh, in terms of not using sort of the user's device irresponsibly uh, to do scans, and also from a reliability standpoint making sure that we uh, show nearby beacons as often as possible. Um, and that's something that we're continually investing in and we want to improve this year. Actually, question for the audience. How many of you have actually developed on the Google Beacon platform? A couple of you. Way, OK. Are there any, are there any things that you, you, you find you know, could, be, could be useful you know, for, for your own development? Oh wow, you guys are doing it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no changes are, whatsoever. Everything you guys works are fired. great. We're done. It's like yeah. You guys are done. We've we've officially launched uh, successful products. Let's then. just go home. <laughs> yeah, we're done. No Thanks. more roadmaps. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, do, um, how much time do we have? Five minutes. Cool. Are there any live questions? Oh, one note for that. Yeah, um, I, I so can share with you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you want to ask the question yeah, again? The um, sort of question there is uh, whether we have uh, kind of roadmap of what is coming up next. Um, sure. What I can share with you today is we are very much so focused on first party based integrations. So, thing, the products, for example, like Google Now, um, et cetera, we can't really talk about too much in that. Uh, but I will tell you that focusing all of our efforts um, directly within our first party products is very important to us. We're, we're strategically positioning um, the entire Eddystone spec to make sure that it works very seamlessly behind the scenes. Um, and so being able to have those integrations in place are kind of what uh, the entire team are, are focusing on today. Um, so look for that in the upcoming quarters. And uh, that's kind of what I have to share today. Uh, on the physical website, we're, we're focused on two main things uh, over the next couple quarters. One is strengthening our cross-platform story. Um, so we're really investing in our Android release that's, that's mm -hmm. that'll be coming up uh, this quarter. Uh, and the second is continuing to improve our ranking service. Uh, today, in today's world, there aren't too many beacons out there, so ranking isn't a huge problem beyond making sure that we serve high quality, sort of spam-free results. But over time, as we invest in larger deployments, we're expecting users to discover lots of beacons out in the wild, um, in which case ranking becomes increasingly important to make sure that we surface the most relevant, the most useful results first to the user, so we want to continue to invest there. Um, we talk about all this stuff on our, on our GitHub, and we invite you guys to sort of join in the conversation if you feel like there's things you think we should be improving to, and we'll, we'll do our best to respond quickly. Just one question. Uh -huh. Uh, 
I, so I missed the first part of your question, but it, I'm so is the is the question about best practice in terms of physical deployments of beacons. Yeah. So you say yeah. So the question there is the what are the best practices in terms of sticking the beacons up and um, preventing them being vandalized. Yeah. Yeah. We find it hard <laughs> typically to provide generic uh, advice because it's so dependent on sort of the room and the physical location that you're in, the materials in the room, the number of people that tend to be in the room, because all these things affect the interference of of the the waves emitted by the beacons. But general sort of trends that we've observed. Uh, placing them higher rather than lower uh, prevents vandalism while also providing sort of a more direct line of sight to the user's device to decrease the likelihood of path loss. That tends to be something that, that works better. Um, other attributes that are generic, I'm trying to think of off the top of my head. Yeah, so um, try, try not to make sure that there are any obstructions which yeah. are basically in the path of the beacon to uh, the user. That's probably be the biggest one. Yeah, and also um, this is a tip from Scott: is that um, basically buy the strongest glue that you can buy on the <laughs> market. Um, you, you would not believe how many beacons just kind of fall off on their own. Um, and um, yeah, so that's that's one top tip there. No, directly from the source. So Scott say no. Um, and also, when in doubt, uh, tend towards decreasing the signal strength of the beacon rather than increasing, because these things have a much bigger range than you'd expect. And um, in certain applications, you wouldn't want uh, a certain beacon to be discoverable from a far away or adjacent room. And so, smaller signal strength tends to tends to help that. So the question there is, um, how does glass impact the signal? What we find in the London office is they pass straight through, so um, it increases the range significantly. Hmm. Question. So the question there is how many people are interacting with beacons uh, through the Google Beacon For platform? Example, Um, do you want to restate that? Sure. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so the um, so so there's two sides to, to that story. I know that as developers, we want as much kind of numbers and, and analytics as we want, uh, or as we could, you know, in terms of how many people are seeing those beacons. Um, so the the two sides to the answer is one: we want to pro uh, protect the user's privacy. So you know, as uh, in, in in Scott's presentation, um, he said that you know the developers themselves would not be able to see. Um, which user can see the link but not click on the link um, f in the physical web to purely just protect uh, privacy. Um, and it's a similar story with, um, uh, with application as well. So when the application is interacting with your app, then you can you know, write your own an analytics code and say, oh, this you know, person um, opt-in to use the nearby functionality and they see these three beacons. So you can uh, you know, collect those kind of information but only with the user's permission. So it's more like this is an app design rather than something that the system framework is built for. Um, so the sort of follow-up question there is, um, is within the app design rather than uh, within the framework? Uh, yes, so it is, is within your app um, that you can collect the information if the user give you the permission. I think the one thing I would really stress is that in Eddystone, we're very focused on user privacy as well as security. So please keep that in mind when you're building your apps. Um, try to use the best practices that we've like set forth. Um, and I think that's something to keep in mind as well, to be able to establish that user trust, mm -hmm. keep it intact, and then uh, not infringe upon that on the user. So the um, yeah, so the uh, question there, follow-up question there is, you know, whether um, there could be a background service that could be run in order to see, you know, which part of the store, or which part of the location is most frequent by uh, customers, let's say, um, kind of, um, yeah, in that in that kind of use case. 
Yeah, I think that's uh, a lot of those kind of uh, special kind of like needs that you would want to have for your app would be done directly dire uh, within your app framework itself and whatever it is that you'd be building proprietary. Right. Yeah. So, so a developer can still ultimately log the end user interaction as facilitated by a beacon if they tap on a link, if they take an action that the beacon sort of supports, but not the scan itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah basically you need to kind of, I guess, give some value back to the user and explain why you would need that. Um, um, because a user will need to um, uh, click on that permission dialog and say, yeah, I will allow this app to, uh, to track me. So, um, yeah, so think about the, perhaps the user value um, side of things as well. Cool. It's important to keep in mind that the days are still sort of early for the Beacon ecosystem. And, you know, when, when we talk to users about Beacons, like one of the foremost concerns on their mind is sort of privacy and, and, and being logged. And so we, we want to be especially cognizant of making sure that we're being responsible about collecting the minimum amount of data possible. If, if anything, uh, in, in these deployments while still providing value. Maybe time for one more question, if there is one. No? Okay, you guys have done well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you.